Lords and ladies, imagine, if you will, two individuals playing the same musical instrument, yet neither one was aware of the other's existence. Now imagine, if you will, both wind up at the same place. Yes, fountain on the green. And it wasn't long before these two became good friends. So join me now as we listen to John Nichols and John Ray as they play separately on the bagpipes. <laughs> and ladies, one of our favorite pastimes in Firenze is the dance, and I pride myself on teaching dances that most anyone can do, young or old, age does not matter, we simply get you off your feet and having a good time. We present to you now some simple dances that even you can do. Oh, 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 
to you some more music from the likes of Ariana, Zach and Riley playing at the Renaissance Fair. For your enjoyment, enjoy. We are live on Facebook with the Alabama Renaissance Fair. Would you tell us a little about yourself, please? Hi, uh, my name is Ariana. This is Riley. This is Zach. And then this is our first year here at the Alabama Renaissance Festival. Wolves and ladies, the Alabama Renaissance Fair has started from a handful of vendors and just a scant few entertainers to what we know and love today. At this time, we wish to present to you a look back at fair's past so that you can see just how the fair has changed low these many years and to what we have come to know and love.
for something completely different. We bring to you a medieval moment. A medieval moment. Tournaments. Probably no other image conjures up a romantic notion of the Middle Ages more than a tournament or joust. However, tournaments were not always the well-regulated sport of pomp and chivalric exhibition they later became. Tournaments most likely originated as combat training in late 11th century France, when the tactic of charging as a coordinated unit first began. This new tactic of charging with couched lances, lances stuck lightly under the arm rather than used like a spear or thrown overarm, required regular training. The boundary for a tournament was usually unmarked and though the chief weapons were the lance and the sword, there were actually no weapons restrictions. All was fair in a tournament, including ambushes and other clever tactics. Even foot soldiers had a role to play as a group of knights could hide behind their men-at-arms until they were ready to charge. As in war, if you lost, you would also forfeit your horse and armor. Thus, the tournaments of this early period were hazardous and bloody, hardly distinguishable from actual combat. As such, the church made repeated efforts to ban tournaments as too violent and dangerous. In 1130, the Council of Clermont decreed that, quote, We firmly prohibit those detestable markets or fairs at which knights are accustomed to meet to show off their strength and their boldness, unquote. William Marshall was the jousting superstar of 12th century England. According to historians Danny Danzinger and John Gilliam, when William Marshall was on his deathbed in 1219, he was told by a priest that he would get to heaven only if he restored all his ill-gotten tournament winnings. The old warrior, he was now in his 70s, retorted that that was impossible. Quote, If because of this the kingdom of heaven is closed to me, I can do nothing about it, for I can't return those things. I can only commend myself to God, repenting my sins. Unless the clergy want my damnation, they can ask for no more than that but their teaching must be false or else no one would be saved." Unquote. However, tournaments simply proved too popular, with the tournament reportedly being held once a fortnight on the continent by the late 12th century. Kings like the English Richard I, the Lionheart, were avid jousters. The Lionheart abolished the ban on tournaments decreed by his father, Henry II. Richard's much later successor, Henry VIII, was also an avid jouster. By the end of the 12th century, tournaments were being glorified in chivalric literature. They were literally the sport of kings and were as popular then as baseball or football are today. It was in the 13th century, however, that tournaments became more ceremonial and regulated, as lists or enclosed spaces became common. Also, leather armor was often worn, and blunted weapons made of whalebone were used, and the joust or tilt, specifically single combats, though a knight might be part of a team, became popular. From 1250 onwards, the challenger was allowed to choose whether the joust would be a plaisance, a joust apiece with blunted lances, or a outrance a joust of war with sharpened lances. Opponents charged each other from opposite ends of the field with couched lances held at an angle, the aim being to unseat one's opponent. Prizes were awarded by noble ladies, who commonly bestowed kisses or rings, as well as bestowing favors to the knights, who carried them or wore them into combat, with a knight's victory dedicated to the lady whose favor he carried. By the end of the 12th century, judges and heralds began to make an appearance at tournaments to help keep score and maintain order. Heralds also began to record and regulate the use of coats of arms, 
which first appeared in Europe in the late 12th century as a quick and easy way to recognize knights under their armor. In England in 1484, a college of arms, which exists to this day, was created by King Richard III so that English heralds could more easily register, record, and regulate the use of coats of arms. The official or referee at a tournament was known as the Marshal of the List, who carried a white arrow. If he threw the arrow down, it was a signal for the combatants to cease fighting. Besides the tilt or joust, tournaments also included foot combat in which the knights initially wore their field harness as if for actual battle and in which any weapons were allowed with the polax being a favorite. Such combats were typically fought in an enclosure called in French a champ close over a wooden barrier separating the contestants. In such cases leg armor wasn't required. A general melee or foot combat involving teams of knights was a popular way to end a tournament. Here we see English Knight Sir Geoffrey Luttrell being armed for a tournament by his wife and daughter-in-law from the 14th century Luttrell Psalter. In the image on the left, we see preparations for a French tournament of circa the 1350s. In the image on the right, we see French Knight Jacques de Lalingue arriving at a tournament with the Counts of Maine and St. Paul in 1530. By the 15th century, a distinctive form of tournament called a pas d'armes became popular in which an individual knight or team of knights defended an area from opponents, which spectacles often included staging, acting, and a plot based upon a chivalric romance. With the gradual move to plate armor by the late 14th century, special heavier harnesses of jousting armor were being worn. Also in Italy in 1420 a tilt barrier, a wooden fence running the length of the list and separating the jousters was added. By this time jousting had evolved into a purely spectator sport, with points being awarded for the number of pieces your lance splintered into when it made contact with your opponent, whether you hit his shield, etc. In this slide, we see an illumination of a tournament of circa 1472. Note the wooden tilt barrier in the center of the course. In these next two slides, we'll see some of the arms and weapons of medieval knights from the collection of the royal armories in Great Britain. In a kind of nostalgia for the good old days of chivalry, tournaments continued in Europe through the reigns of Henry VIII, who was almost killed on one occasion in 1524, all the way into the reign of his daughter Elizabeth I, who reigned from 1558 till 1603, long after knighthood had died out. An avid jouster, Henry had several harnesses of custom-made tournament armor, some given to him as gifts. Suggested by his chief advisor, Cardinal Wolsey, Henry's most famous and lavish tournament was held on the continent at the English-held city of Calais at the Field of the Cloth of Gold in June of 1520, in which Henry and his knights jousted against the King of France and his knights. The name comes from the fact that the tents and pavilions were made with real cloth of gold, filaments of gold sewn with silk to make the fabric. England and France were long and bitter rivals, yet Henry needed to ally himself with either Francis Francis I or Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, as they were the two most powerful monarchs at the time. Thus the field of the cloth of gold was a kind of summit between Henry and Francis to decide the issue. It nearly bankrupted the treasuries of both realms as each tried to outdo the other and ended with Henry allying himself with Charles and the Holy Roman Empire after French King Francis bested the young King Henry in a wrestling match. The Holy Roman Empire then declared war on France, which Henry was obliged to support.
This has been a medieval moment with Lee Freeman. For more information on a variety of medieval topics, check out Medieval Speak, a medieval word book by Lee Freeman.
Lords and ladies, we now wish to bring you some more music for your entertainment, and we have with us Jock Stewart. He is no longer walking this earth, and he will surely be missed, but may this song continue to live in our hearts and uplift our spirits. God rest your soul, Jock Stewart. Stewart's show at the South South Davin stage. This is Jock Stewart. You got any suspicion? Good God Almighty says I am. What sort of a man do you think I am? I've only one, she's not too tight. One down the wheel is quicker in a lot. Oh, I'll be told you to go. I've only one, she's not too tight. She wouldn't have to be a little quicker in a lot. Says he. Does she come from another planet? Does she have a bee in her bonnet? Does she do her daily duty? You never know, might be suited. I'm the rats from the world's big candlelight. Some of them started shuffling off. We're gonna have some fun tonight. Getting ready for the real gorilla. Hold her on, we go heel to the toe. We're gonna have some fun tonight. Getting ready for the real gorilla. I could see he had no scruples when I looked into his eagles. They were purple, all magenta, like a statue during Lent. So I said, I'll get her right away. Good man, says he, not from the lake. We're gonna have some fun tonight. Then he clicked his heels with a flicker in a Oh, we're on to the road, to the Gonna have some fun tonight. Then he clicked his heels with a flicker in a then up stepped a red carnation. They gave her an ovation. She was warm and enchanting as she slowly started dancing. A poor old pigeon skilled his eye, held in the corner and came aside. Daddy long legs, smile, oh my, are you ready for the view in the flickering light? Oh, Ralph, go, you can go. Daddy long legs, smile, oh my, are you ready for the view in the flickering light? She was handsome, she was charming. I heard him call it Carlin. He was graceful as a whisper on his delicate legs of silver. And the rats and the worms whisper as my that poor old pigeon says that night. Dreamy veil on a lovely bright. And the real in the green light. Oh, around the cold, here to the cold. Shimmering veil on a lovely bright. And the dance of you in the green light. Oh, around the cold, here to the cold. Shimmering veil on a lovely bright. The dance of you in the green light. That was Jock Stewart live at the Alabama Renaissance Fair at the South Devon Stage. Renaissance Fair, and we are going live today. Hello, my name is Jock Stewart, otherwise known as Jesse Linder, and uh, I'm going to do a Scottish song for you. A can rainy is a night. There's no a star in all the carry. Lightning gleams athwart the rift. Cold winds blow. Winter's fury. How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? Let me in for love for Lynn. It's how they know the wool are craggy. If the sides of poultry bank, the rifted wood roars wild and dreary. How the iron gets the strength, the cry of Paulus acts weary. How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? Let me in, pull out the limbs, how the north of Warlock Craggy. On my breath, I cannot speak. A fear I rouse, a cry of daddy. Cold wind blows upon my cheek. Arise, arise, me bonnie lady. How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? How oh, are you sleeping? 
sleep at Maggie. Let me in for love the limb. His howl and lord the warlock Greggy. Let him in, he's cast aside his dripping flatty. Blow your worst chill, rain and wind, since Maggie now, here aside ye. Now that you're working, Maggie, now that you're working, Maggie, what care I for hurlers cry, for Buttery Bank, all our craggy. How are you sleeping, Maggie? How oh, are you sleeping, Maggie? Let me in for loud the limb is howling o'er the warlock Reggie. <laughs> huzzah, huzzah. <laughs> Jock Stewart, how long have you been with the Alabama Renaissance Fair? Uh, this is only my second year, but I was made welcome here from, from the first moment I stepped on site. Well, we, we love having you here, and we listen to you playing in the lanes all day yesterday, and we look forward to hearing you again today. I'm so, to go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm looking forward to it as well. I, I love playing for the passes by. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lords and ladies, though the Alabama Renaissance Fair considers itself a family-friendly event, well, everything you see is indeed family-friendly. We do offer a specific children's area that you need to make sure you visit the next time you come to the fair. Next, we're going to see a brief clip showing this children's area so you'll know just what you would receive should you bring your child by. We just need you to know that it is not a babysitting service. So don't drop your child off and then wander to the rest of the fair, because we do not have folks looking after the little ones. That would be your job as the parent or guardian. Uh, I'm walking into the children's area here. The South Devon stage can be found near the children's area. You can see we have a rousing game of croquet happening. The ball is a hedgehog and the flamingo mallets straight out of Alice in Wonderland. The hay pile is always a fun activity for the children. There are hidden tokens in the hay pile. So as the children find the tokens they can take them to the activity booth and trade them for prizes. Lords and ladies, many of you are fans of the great Bard Shakespeare, and Firenze is no exception. Many of us enjoy his wondrous poems and plays as well, and now we present John Gibbons, or a.k.a. John Sterling, reciting Shakespeare. the winter of our discontent, made glorious summer by this son of York. And all the clouds that loud upon our house, in the deep bosom of the ocean, buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious wreaths, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms changed to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visaged war had smoothed his wrinkled front, and now instead of mounting barbed steeds to fright the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. While I, who am not made for sportive tricks, 
for me to court an amorous look at the moment. I then am rudely stamped, and want Love's Majesty to strut before a wanton hambling nymph. I that am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sin before my time in this breathing world, half scarce made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable. Dogs barking as I hope body. While I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delights to pass away the time, unless to spy my shadow in the sun and dislike on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain. I hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid. Inductions dangerous. To set my brother, Clarence, and the king, the one against the other, in deadly hate. And if Edward be as true and just as I am, subtle, false, and treacherous, then this day shall Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says, of G, the murderer of Edward's heir shall be. Dive thoughts down into my soul. Here Clarence comes. Lords and ladies, I know many of you have visited our fair autumn festival, but for those of you who might not, we wish to peel back the curtain and provide you an, a look inside the fair and show you just who we are doing what we do. To that end, we present this look at some of our volunteers who are all volunteers of a group known as the Round Table, who have been doing this for many years. You only need to have a love of the time period and a desire to share that love with others, to join the Round Table and assist in putting on the fair and keeping it alive from year to year. So join us now as we meet some of our volunteers and what the Renaissance Fair means to me. Hello, my name is John Gibbons, and I have been involved in the Alabama Renaissance Fair for the past 10 years. For the first year, I did nothing but wander around the place and look like I belong there. After that, I got involved with Dr. Leslie Peterson, and her Shakespeare team called the Willyhams, where we walked around the park and we did Shakespeare at people. Then I started my own little operation called Renaissance Rosary and Relics. And if you've been in the park the past three years, you heard me call out, Relics, get your relics here, or get them while they're still holy, I mean relic here, dragon feet, dragon eyes, and fairy dust. I gotta tell you, after a while of doing that, I need every last drop of water I can get down my throat. You have no idea how hard it is to maintain that accent. Anyway, I've been very happy to be a part of the Renaissance Fair for the past 10 years. I got involved because I went to a job fair. I met a representative from the Florence City School System. I showed him my portfolio and the back of which were some pieces of art that I felt would demonstrate to a principal my creative skills and how they could be used to benefit a classroom. Now, Mr. Warren took my resume, 
he gave him the, uh, the application. And he looked at those pictures and went, you need to be a part of us. And I've been a part of it ever since. And it's been a very great time. Uh, there are some wonderful people, uh, some very creative, very intelligent people. And we're kind of this um, interesting family that we meet once a year, hold a big family reunion, and the entire northwest corner of Alabama is invited. This year, of course, we're not getting to hold the fair, but we will be back next year. So I hope you're enjoying the virtual fair, and I hope to see you again next year at Wilson Park when you'll no doubt hear me yell at well, Alex, get your heart on Alex here. Well, lords and ladies, I hope that you have enjoyed this day two of the 2020 Alabama Virtual Renaissance Fair. As you can see, I am back outdoors. I did find Serene, Her Majesty, hiding within the woods. Yes, we are still camped out, avoiding the curse. Well, she was hiding from herself and was pouting that she couldn't find her yet. Ah, uh, hmm. To be true, yes. It's all a fantasy world around here, and you come to the festival in 2021, and, well, you'll see for yourself just what we have to deal with. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed yourself, and I look forward to seeing you at the next fair in 2021 at Fountain on the Green. Enjoy.